The House of the Dead remake recently launched on Switch, shortly followed by releases on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. Although reviews for the Switch version were mixed, I decided to pick up the PS4 version and, while some fears were confirmed, I also came across a number of pleasant surprises. Before we get into the video, let it be said that I adore light gun games. I kept hold of a CRT television, the only kind of TV a traditional light gun works on, just so that I could get my Time Crisis on. The Dreamcast release of House of the Dead 2 specifically is one of my favourite titles to quite literally blast through. When a remake of the original House of the Dead was announced, I was incredibly excited. The Saturn and PC home ports weren't exactly arcade quality, far from it. I hoped this might cause a resurgence for light gun games in general, similar to the recent revival of side-scrolling beat-em-ups, and I was curious as to how Forever Entertainment would provide us with a modern light gun solution. Hell, I cared enough about this game and its potential impact on the industry to press pause on multiple video projects that I already had in the works to make the very review that you're watching right now. I felt like that much was riding on the success or failure of this remake. Let's not ignore the elephant in the room. The House of the Dead remake doesn't come with a light gun. Instead, we have the option of either using gyro controls or analog sticks to aim and shoot. I suppose the questions then become, was that a good decision, how well does their compromise work, and is the game still fun without a light gun? The good news is that this is a very faithful remake of an already excellent game. Arcade games are usually criticised for their short length, and The House of the Dead counters this with its replayability. You have your standard high scores, there are scientists to save, but the crowning jewel has always been the multiple routes through the game's four stages. At various points, saving people, shooting locks and switches, even just killing enemies in a different order, will take you down a different path. These all interweave and intertwine in a similar fashion to Sonic levels. Oh come on, you knew there was going to be a reference in here somewhere. The start and end points are preset, but the road in between is largely up to the player. There are a lot of choices too. In my six complete playthroughs, I didn't unlock the trophy for visiting each branching path. This feature alone means that seeing everything is going to require multiple runs. You may even find yourself developing a favourite or optimal route. Granted, some of the decisions are invisible at first, and the switching rails become fewer and further between as you progress, with the final stage being entirely linear, but it's certainly a compelling reason to fire up another session immediately after the credits roll. Sadly, you only see which paths you've explored if you get a game over. Seeing as this remake starts you off with 10 credits, and allows you to trade 5,000 points off your high score for additional continues should you need them, it's a screen you're unlikely to ever see. To the point that I don't even have footage of it. It would have been nice if the statistics, gallery, or options menu allowed you to view the map, marking where you've been, to further encourage exploration and help with tracking the associated achievement. The difficulty has been noticeably lowered, and not just with the generous number of retries you're given. By default, the game will be set to normal, with easy, hard, and arcade options also available. In most modes, instead of losing one piece of health per hit, you lose half a point, effectively doubling your total HP. The options menu also allows you to adjust your cursor speed and the level of aim assist provided to lower the challenge further, which I applaud from an accessibility standpoint. If you're looking for a challenge, then the new Horde mode might be a better fit. This floods the screen with enemies, possibly too many of them. I was frequently overwhelmed and couldn't avoid taking damage. It can be very difficult to manage these large crowds with just a handgun, and a later hidden unlockable might explain why. The developers saw complaints about these games lacking replay value coming from a mile away. They added a new mode, they gave you multiple scoring systems to choose from, and then they used the trophy system to hint at other elements, such as the game's free endings. Strangely enough, the game tells you that earning trophies can unlock old-school cheat codes, incentivizing players to go for a platinum trophy, 
but despite passing multiple thresholds for unlocking them, I have no idea where to find them in-game. Granted, there are plenty of lists online where, strangely, I also learned that some of the trophies are seemingly impossible to unlock without using these cheats. For example, there's a trophy for beating an entire stage without reloading that appears to require using the infinite ammo cheat. The biggest tease of all is the gun cabinet, and here we have one of my favourite additions, but also one of my biggest complaints. To unlock the cabinet, you have to save every single scientist in a single playthrough. That's not an easy feat, and something I only just about managed on my fifth run. My multiple failed attempts certainly made a playthrough where I was purposely killing scientists for the Psychopath Trophy feel much more cathartic. Even when you do unlock the cabinet, it's empty. You now need to do yet another playthrough, finding and shooting hidden chests throughout the game's four stages to add the new guns to your armory. For me, the new weapons, especially the pitter that pins enemies to walls, make the game feel fresh again. They add that Resident Evil transition from being powerless to overpowered, that progression and satisfaction that House of the Dead otherwise lacks. The assault rifle was the most comfortable weapon to use, as I could finally just hold R2 instead of tapping it to fire. It made the game feel more like House of the Dead 4 in that regard. The grenade launcher is so broken that it actually prevents the final boss from performing his signature attack. In terms of sheer crowd control, it can't be beaten. These weapons are a lot of fun, and a unique selling point for this version of the game. Sadly, they're buried so deep, and their unlock requirements have such a high skill ceiling, that most casual players will never discover them. I think a ton of people will move on from this game long before they even realise they can get their hands on brand new ordnance. If it were me, I would populate the chests in the mansion after a single playthrough. That way, you have to reach the end using just the handgun, per the arcade original, but you would have a message at the end compelling you to return and find the new weaponry. However you splatter the red stuff, you'll be seeing it in its highest graphical detail yet. On a technical level, this remake outperforms the arcade original. That's to be expected given the 26 year gap between the two. There are some hitches, especially pop-in and level of detail problems, even in the PS4 version running on a PlayStation 5. There are also some minor judders and freezes during the game, especially in the final corridor and in horde mode, where enemy counts were significantly higher, causing the game to render more objects on screen at once. Still, I've seen this hardware display much higher quality assets with significantly more stability. Aesthetically, you can tell this is a budget title where the primary platform was the Nintendo Switch. Everything feels a little surreal. The way light is handled gives a slimy sheen to everything, like you're in a house of wax where every display has been doused in oil. These armoured enemies in particular stood out to me. They seemed stiff. I think they're armoured, but they had a robotic vibe about them instead. Graphically, they felt like they came from a pre-rendered cutscene on the Sega Saturn. Strangely, and I think this might be the colour choices at play, the game ends up with a B-movie cheesy horror vibe. Intentional or not, it kind of ends up playing into how hammy House of the Dead can be as a franchise. It doesn't take itself too seriously, which, considering some of the sights and enemies you'll come across, fits pretty well. The lack of polish does extend to some other areas of the game, including spelling mistakes in the subtitles and this amateur-feeling smiley face at the end of the credits. Some cutscenes appear to be pre-rendered rather than being in-engine, with obvious compression. I can see why, in terms of look and feel, people have described this as feeling like a fan game rather than an official product. Where it does feel fan-made in a positive way is its faithfulness to the original. This remake isn't a reimagining. Enemy placements and stage layouts are exactly the same as I remember them. Movement speed, enemy patterns, hidden collectibles, the game behaved exactly as I expected it to. Of course, that means it comes with the original game's problems too. The final level is still a boss rush, and no one likes recycled encounters. 
especially when the game's so short that it feels like it's only been five minutes since you first killed them. Overall though, there's a lot here that's very promising, and very much worth the asking price to most people, if you can get over the single biggest issue, the fact that you don't have a gun in your hands. You have two control options. The first is gyro aiming, and to be fair, I get where the idea came from. It's something that's in every Joy-Con and DualShock 4, the controllers that came with the console. All of your players have them, and it can somewhat simulate the variable speeds of a mouse or light gun. On PlayStation alone, Infamous Second Son, Concrete Genie, and Tearaway Unfolded make great use of this exact tech. The problem with the Joy-Con is that it has no weight to it. It's hard to keep a steady aim. Meanwhile, the DualShock 4 is sturdier, with two handles to grip, but feels even less like a gun. You don't point it at the screen, you just sort of swoosh it around in your hands and try to feel out where the boundaries are. The weird thing is, I think it could have worked, but I kept losing track of my cursor, I kept having to recenter my reticule to the centre of the screen as it wandered off, and at a few points the cursor went completely haywire, flying around while I was completely still. In the end, I gave up on it and defaulted to using the analog stick. It's fine, I guess. There are a lot of options to adjust the speed and sensitivity which is appreciated, but am I playing a light gun shooter or a fast paced zero puzzles point and click adventure? Yes, I had fun with that control scheme. Sure, I could reliably beat the game using it, they even let me outright bully certain bosses, but the entire experience was compromised. I spent my time with the game wishing I had a gun in my hands instead. By the end of a session, my hand even felt a little cramped and uncomfortable. We know that traditional light guns don't work on modern televisions, so are Forever Entertainment excused for releasing a light gun game without, well, a light gun due to technical impossibility, and is there any point to releasing these kinds of games at all if you don't have that peripheral? Let's first of all squash the idea that it's technically impossible to have a light gun on a modern display. Homebrew projects like the Gun 4 IR and Descendant both prove that you can have accurate light guns on modern TVs. Descendant is even being used in arcade one-up machines, specifically their replicas of Big Buck Hunter and Terminator 2. The Polymega console, which plays retro games from multiple systems, has also advertised a Sindon partnership. If you're using the PC version of the game and you have a gun for IR or a Sindon, secondhand reports state that you can use those guns and it does elevate the experience. The issue is that the gun for IR is a DIY project that's beyond my personal skill or comfort level, while the Sindon has had regular production issues that has seen people waiting eight months or more to receive the product. They're certainly not widely available to the general public, with only diehard enthusiasts knowing that they even exist. You could also argue that those guns represent relatively new technology. Well, again, no. The GunCon 3 that released alongside the PS3 port of Time Crisis 4 used IR sensors mounted to the TV in a setup that's very similar to the Gun 4 IRs all the way back in 2007. That's 15 years ago! My understanding is that similar tech is behind 2015's arcade-only Time Crisis 5 and 2018's House of the Dead Scarlet Dawn. Later PS3 games, including a re-release of Time Crisis 4 and the only home version of House of the Dead 4, used the PlayStation Move, itself inspired by the Wii, which was home to ports of Ghost Squad, Resident Evil The Dark Side Chronicles, and, oh yeah, House of the Dead 2 and 3. We're still seeing the Move being used in the PlayStation Aim controller for VR shooters, the seeming evolution of light gun games, such as Blood and Truth, Farpoint, and Doom VFR. Granted, the Wiimote and PlayStation Move don't have the accuracy of a real light gun, nor can they hold a candle to the Gun 4 IR and Sindon, but the actual feel of holding a gun-shaped object and swishing it around contributes significantly to the experience of these games. The ergonomics of holding and firing a pretend gun 
even one that's woefully inaccurate like the Wii's, sells the illusion and increases immersion. Even budget titles on the Switch understand this, with Martian Panic and Chicken Range coming with plastic gun shells that you put your Joy-Con in. It doesn't make the aiming any more accurate, but it does trick your brain. I don't understand how House of the Dead has a physical release, yet doesn't include, at the very least, a gun shell for the Joy-Con. Thankfully, Forever Entertainment have announced that PlayStation Move support will be coming to the PS4 version, an undisclosed future date in a patch. Frustratingly, using tech that Sony mostly no longer sells. I did have a PlayStation Move and its gun casing for playing light gun games on PS3, but I didn't have a PlayStation camera. I found out the hard way that you can only buy those used now, at least in the UK. I then found out that I needed an adapter cable to use it with my PlayStation 5, and the only way to get one is to send Sony a form with the serial number of a PlayStation VR headset that I don't have. Luckily, third parties have made clones of this adapter, so I bought one from China. I'm now set and ready for when this patch hits, but most consumers won't be. I think if Forever Entertainment worked with Sony to provide the game, a move, the gun shell, and the camera in a physical bundle, nostalgic normies would buy them from the shelves. When that patch releases, I might make a follow-up video. For now, I can only review the game in its current form. My assumption is it will be transformative for the overall experience and make this release much easier to recommend. I'm also fortunate enough that a friend has recently built himself a gun for IR and is happy to build me one too. When I get that, I'll consider picking up the Steam version and reporting back, but again, I will be a fringe user with access to hardware that a typical consumer doesn't have to hand. That being the case, I can't get over the idea that anyone would release a light gun game without thoroughly answering the question, okay, what are we going to do about the gun? The main thing that you use to interact with the game that most people won't have. That move support should not be a future patch, it should have been there day one. Better still, once the project was greenlit and development had started, Forever Entertainment should have been calling the guys behind the gun for IR and the Sindon, looking to make a deal for a consumer model modern light gun. After all, Arcade 1UP did exactly that for their replica arcade cabinets. And don't tell me that it's too niche, or that it wouldn't sell, or that it wouldn't be commercially viable as a business venture. If there's no demand for light guns, then there's no demand for light gun games. I know I'm labouring the point, but my dad brought me up on a very simple phrase. If something's worth doing, then it's worth doing it right. My number one priority for this release seems to have been Forever Entertainment's Afterthought. They half assed the single most important part of this interactive experience. They failed to solve the main issue, and I see that as a massive missed opportunity to engage with a nostalgic yet more casual market. This game could sell Sindons to the masses and spark an overnight revival of the entire genre. We might even get home releases of Time Crisis 5 and House of the Dead Scarlet Dawn if the publisher had the risk appetite. I want that future. That's the best outcome for everyone here, and I'm so disappointed that it hasn't happened. It's a shame that they weren't prepared to do that because I ended up having a good time with this game. I think this is a decent remake that's clearly had effort put into it. I really do want to stress that, as I'm aware that my tantrum over not getting a gun-shaped piece of plastic might make you think otherwise. If you think that the gyro controls are going to be good enough for you, then by all means pick this game up. If you're a light gun enthusiast, if the lack of a proper light gun is going to be a deal breaker for you, then either get the PC release and use the Sindon or Gun for IR that you no doubt already own, or refuse to buy it out of some form of protest. As for me, I'm going to cross my fingers for that move update and wait excitedly for my friend to build my gun for IR, while lamenting the fact that fans have to take things into their own hands for the time being. <laughs>